you're always eating for blood sugar balance. So it's about what you're adding to your plate um, versus what's on your plate itself. You know, like I think things like the glycemic index make sense if you are eating the food by itself. But there are very few people who are eating white rice in a bowl by itself. Um, you know, they're putting protein on it. They're putting vegetables on it. Um, they're putting fat on it so that it is a balanced meal in, in itself. So, you know, I really tell women not to sweat things like that. Like if you prefer white rice, have the white rice. Just make sure to add the protein, fat, and fiber so that it's, it's a balanced meal. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode brought to you by Let's Get Checked. You can save 20% off your purchase by visiting tylgc.com slash PCOS and using the code PCOS20 at checkout. Hello and welcome to episode 58 of the PCOS Oracle podcast. And in today's episode, I speak with Melissa Gonzalez-Azaro. Melissa is an integrative dietitian who helps busy women with hormone imbalances, PCOS, and fertility issues regain regular periods and get pregnant naturally. She uses a functional medicine approach to figure out the root causes of your symptoms and together helps you develop a personalized nutrition supplement and lifestyle plan to help you balance your hormones and optimize your fertility. She works virtually with clients one-on-one as a self-study course on PCOS called the PCOS Root Cause Roadmap and her book, A Balanced Approach to PCOS. So hello and welcome to the Pieces Oracle podcast, Melissa. I'm so honoured to have you on the podcast. It's such a pleasure. I've been following your social media account for some time now. And, you know, I'm just you know, honoured to have you on the podcast and be, to be chatting with you and picking your brain, um, you know, busting some of these <laughs> myths that, you know, we'll be covering in this, in this episode. Because, you know, like you know, there's just so many myths, misconceptions, misinformation, and it's important to provide, you know, through podcast episodes and through content on social media to help women go through all this information that you see on Google and on other people's accounts and stuff like that. And just be able to really pick from it and know what's truth and what's a lie, a myth, um, and create a program that's, you know, a lifestyle diet that's geared towards them that's taken into consideration their root cause their hormone imbalance um so yeah that's basically in this episode we'll be talking about diet peace versus and diet which is like the, probably the biggest uh topic within pcos that everyone's always talking about because there's always new diets coming up that we'll be discussing in this episode and just new research as well because obviously as you know pieces isn't really studied as much as we would like but now obviously it's you know getting there's more awareness there's more money going into the study so you know that's great so before we delve into you know the key questions everyone wants to know like the best diet um you know stuff like that let's first off just get a bit of background on who you are what you do how you help women with pcos and touch on a bit about your book as well because you've got a new book coming out but we'll delve, delve into that a lot more throughout the episode but yeah, so just jump straight in, talk a bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I am Melissa Groves Azero. I'm still getting used to saying the Azero part because I just got married in October, so still a newlywed. Um, I am a functional medicine dietitian. So I actually went back to school um, as an adult to get my degree in nutrition and become a dietitian. I had been working in New York City advertising for over 15 years and, you know, totally burnt out and just was like, I need to do something else. And, um, you know, realized that it was something I had always been interested in. And I've always struggled with hormone imbalances myself. Um, I don't have PCOS, but I definitely can relate to, you know, being reliant on the pill so that I wouldn't have symptoms and all the things, you know. So, um, you know, I really wanted to, once I started working, um, you know, I, I from a functional medicine perspective, you're always looking for those, those root causes. And so I was working in a practice where I would see all of the clients who came in and wanted to lose weight. 
and we would do the digging, you know, in the form of testing, and we would find that there was almost always some sort of hormone imbalance. That was the reason they weren't losing weight because you were, you know, I would look at what they're eating, I'd look at how much they're exercising, I'm like, why is this not adding up? And you know, there was always something, whether it was low thyroid or high insulin or high cortisol or a condition called PCOS. And so that was when I really first started digging into it and realizing how much um, conventional medicine just fails you guys. <laughs> you know, it's like they give you like the option of going on the pill and then come back when you're ready to get pregnant and we'll give you the fertility meds. And that's basically all they tell you besides telling you, you need to lose weight or you need to eat less and move more. And it's like, that doesn't quite add up in PCOS. Um, so I just really felt like, you know, it was my, my mission to help women who weren't being helped um, through the conventional med medical system. Um, so I use kind of a different approach to PCOS. Um, I use a, a non-restrictive diet. I, I don't think that you have to eliminate any foods for PCOS. Um, you know, and part of the reasoning for that, and I think, you know, doctors, and I've heard naturopaths too, you know, just really prescribing these really restrictive diets for PCOS. And the problem is that PCOS is a lifelong condition. So, you know, telling someone they can never have birthday cake again or never have pizza again is not okay in my book and it's not sustainable. And I think that's why, you know, when you're working with a dietitian who specializes in PCOS, like we know what it's like because we're in the trenches with you every day. And we see like when you tell yourself you can't have sugar, that leads to a sugar binge. <laughs> so, um, you know, really try to guide you in a way that is sustainable. And what I do is I focus on those root causes of PCOS, which for most people are insulin resistance, inflammation, the hormone imbalances, not just the androgens, but other hormones that are imbalanced, um, and the gut imbalances as well, which kind of go hand in hand with PCOS. So when we, you know, kind of take weight and diet off the table um, and just focus on those root causes, then everything starts to come into, into alignment. So um, the book kind of came from that. Um, a publisher reached out to me based on the content I was putting out on Instagram. Um, and they were like, this is different. And I was like, yes, it is. There's literally nothing um, on the market like it right now. So it's a cookbook for PCOS that focuses on those root causes. So it's an anti-inflammatory diet. It's blood sugar balancing. It's got all the things to support gut health. Um, I include a category of foods that I call PCOS power foods, which are foods that actually have a little bit of science behind them, you know, things like cinnamon helps lower blood sugar. So why not incorporate cinnamon into our diets more regularly, things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really like a totally balanced, um, non-restrictive approach to PCOS. And I'm actually really, really excited that the publisher chose the title, um, a balanced approach to PCOS, because it really, um, speaks to the way that I work with women with PCOS. Mm, amazing. And I, I definitely, I love how you are so, your approach is balanced and sustainable. It's not, because, you know, like, <laughs> we all know there's a lot of these, um, a lot of coaching, a lot of information online that's just so restrictive. And a lot of women like myself have been down the road of, you know, cutting gluten, cutting dairy, cutting sugar, cutting fruit, cutting carbs in general, cutting fat trying keto and then like this is so so much you just like you just try every single diet and nothing actually works because you're not getting to that root cause and you end up causing even more you know harm to your body um or just just not fixing the problems a lot of these diets can you know you follow them for a certain period of time and you get these results like the keto but then number one it's not really sustainable and then it can cause further problems down the line because you're not your, your body needs carbs, right? So I feel like this is... So uh, uh, 
Absolutely. I was going to say, I, I see a lot of women who try to go too low calorie or too low carb. And especially when the adrenals play such a, a role in PCOS for so many women, I mean, for some women, um, their PCOS symptoms are really being driven entirely by the adrenals. Um, so adding stress to your body can backfire. And, you know, with something like keto, you lose a lot of weight quickly. Most of it is water, um, but you're jacking your cortisol and your DHEA and, you know, eventually get to that plateau. And that's when they come to me is like, I did keto, it worked, it stopped working. I started putting on belly fat. Like, I, I don't understand what's happening. Um, and we add more carbs. We need carbs. <laughs> sure <laughs> um but so let's kind of de delve into what we kind of were touching on with uh gluten and dairy is there any research at all to suggest that cutting these food groups are bad for pcs okay so last year two years ago the international expert guidelines were published um, and they they did acknowledge nutrition makes a difference in PCOS so like yay win like we know it makes a difference um, you know according to them there's no evidence that any one diet is better than any other um, when you dig into the research on PCOS and gluten um, there's none there's literally not a single study um, I think you know, gluten, yes, is inflammatory for some people. Um, if gluten is a problem for you, then cutting it out might make a difference in your inflammation. Um, but if gluten is not a problem for you, then cutting it out isn't going to do anything. Um, it's pretty similar when it comes to dairy. There was one study um, on dairy in PCOS, and it was... Um, in combination with a low carb diet. So, you know, they lost weight, all their markers got better, their testosterone went down, um, but they were also following a low carb diet. Um, and the funny thing is, you know, with the low carb diets that have been done, when you actually read into the details of them on like what a low carb diet is, it's about 40% of calories, which, you know, isn't, in my opinion, a super low carb diet. It's lower than the standard American diet for sure, but um, it's, you know, a balanced mm. diet, not low carb for sure. Mm. Awesome. So um, let's kind of touch on if someone's looking to find out if gluten is kind of impacting them, are there tests to find this out? So there's tests for celiac disease, um, you know, one, one of the downsides to the testing that exists is that you have to be eating a significant amount of gluten in order for the tests to be valid. Um, so if you've given up gluten and you want to get tested for celiac, you kind of can't because um, they're not, the tests won't work. Um, generally, you know, the gold standard when it comes to um, working with a dietitian and nutrition and food sensitivities is an elimination diet. Um, I never recommend like a comprehensive elimination diet. Um, most people kind of suspect that a food is causing problems for them. Um, you know, I personally am allergic to casein in dairy, so I can't I can't eat dairy. Um, but what I, what I generally recommend doing is, is giving up one food at a time for a brief period of time. You know, give it two weeks, give it three, four weeks max. Um, and if you don't notice any differences since having given that food up, then add it back. It's not, you know, it's not doing anything for you. And I think that's part of the thing I get. I get messages a lot from, from women who are saying, you know, I tried gluten-free, dairy-free um, for three months and literally nothing changed for me, you know? It's like, well, then why are you putting yourself through that added stress then if, if you're not seeing an immediate benefit? I mean, I will tell you when I eat dairy, the, the results are immediate. So um, I definitely notice a difference when I don't eat dairy. Um, but it's, if you don't have a reaction to a food, then why put yourself through unnecessary stress? Mm, exactly. I feel if you eliminate it for a certain amount of time, 
and just notice if you experience any kind of symptoms, any negative effects. I feel like we realize we can we can notice if some kind of food is impacting us. Like I don't know, you might experience brain fog or fatigue or just like your muscles just don't feel you know good. Your cycle might you know you might even notice your cycles start to improve. Something just like there's always something you notice with uh, food that might be impacting you. I think a really interesting thing. I mean, with both both gluten and dairy, um, you know, there's multiple parts to every food. So um, what happens a lot with gluten is that people feel better when they cut it out. They have less bloating, less digestive symptoms. And that's not actually the gluten. The gluten is the protein. Um, people are reacting to the fructans, which are the fermentable carbohydrate that can cause gas and bloating if you have some sort of gut dysbiosis going on. So um, I think what people are actually feeling better about is getting rid of the fructans. And similarly with dairy, you know, some people react to the lactose, some people react to the caffeine. It's, it's totally different for everybody. Mm, yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. I'm glad you touched on that. And I also feel like with a lot of products, like with dairy kind of products, for example, a lot of people, um, you know, there's, you buy products and they've just got a bunch of other ingredients that aren't, you know, artificial sweeteners and all these other kind of not good for your body kind of stuff. So I feel like it's not always the thing that you think it is. <laughs> it's the adding kind of stuff. <laughs> Right. I see that all the time when people go on something like the Whole30 where they're cutting out, you know, gluten and sugar and soy and all of the things and they feel better. And, you know, my question is really, what are you not eating that you normally eat? Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, like what, what food, what processed food are you eating that you're not, you know, that you're reacting to? Exactly. I also, I want to mention too, I think that, you know, insisting that people follow a diet like that is very privileged. Um, you know, it, it makes a lot of assumptions about someone's budget, um, where they live in the world. Um, you know, I don't know if you've spent any time in, say, the middle of America, but it's really freaking hard to find gluten-free, dairy-free you know, any sort of specialty diet there, um, vegetarian, like you just can't do it in the middle of the country. <laughs> you have to, you know, live near a city, you have to have the means with which to buy things. And, you know, I, like I said, I, I avoid dairy, but, you know, I won't buy the $8 cream cheese that's dairy free just on principle, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely agree, yeah. Um, and I feel, a lot of the time we often think when there's alternatives to a certain product like gluten-free products they always assume that because it's got no gluten in it, it's automatically automatically better when people need to like read the label sometimes it's about educating yourself with in ingredients and stuff that's just been put in um, and not just assuming because it's gluten-free it's dairy-free that's automatically healthy healthy yeah there's um it's actually called a health halo when there's a, a label like that put on the front of a product that you make certain assumptions that that it's healthier um and it's just not true you know if you're comparing something like gluten-free rice pasta to even white pasta um there's significantly more protein and fiber even in a white pasta i mean you're going to get even more steps above that if you're picking, you know, a whole wheat version of the pasta or the bread. Um, but yeah, the gluten-free processed foods, like, you know, depending on what they're made with, the pastas and the breads are virtually fiber-free, mm. which is nutrient-free. They're just, you know, you might as well just eat a rice cake at that point if it's just gonna, you know, the, the goal is just to get whatever is spread on it into your mouth. <laughs> so let's kind of touch on briefly about the whole white pasta, white rice, because obviously there's this whole fear, phobia that everything that's just, you know, white rice is against, you know, women with pizza shouldn't eat it. So, you know, what, what's your like response to, to our listeners? Yeah, back to it. It's kind of a theme here today. I think that's very privileged to tell someone there are so, so many cultures um, in the world for whom white rice is the staple, you know, and I'm 
talking India and talking Asia, China, um, you know, um, many Latina, it's Hispanic countries, um, rice is the basis, white rice. Um, and so that's when you grow up on a food, it, you, you can't demonize a food that someone grew up on. Um, the way that I approach it um, is because you're, you're always eating for a blood sugar balance. So it's about what you're adding to your plate um, versus what's on your plate itself. You know, like I think things like the glycemic index make sense if you are eating the food by itself. But there are very few people who are eating white rice in a bowl by itself. Um, you know, they're putting protein on it. They're putting vegetables on it. Um, they're putting fat on it so that it is a balanced meal in, in itself. So, you know, I really tell women not to sweat things like that. Like if you prefer white rice, have the white rice. Just make sure to add the protein, fat, and fiber so that it's, it's a balanced meal. Mm, awesome. Yeah, definitely. And that's... Like you said, blood sugar balance is one of the biggest kind of components when we're looking at pieces and diet and nutrition. So, you know, let's kind of touch on some more of the very uh, common, popular diet topics. And one of them is intermittent fasting as well. I get a lot of questions on this. And I kind of want to just discuss this as well really quickly. What's your kind of, is, is there any you know, I can't, I, we all know there's benefits to intermittent fasting for, you know, there's been research, we, all, we know that there's you know, huge benefits, but is it something women with ketosis and hormonal issues should be doing? Yeah, um, I think that the research is really interesting. I think the, you know, the largest amount of research on fasting and its benefits has to do with longevity and aging. Um, there is a significant amount of research on fasting and insulin resistance and blood sugar levels. So you can see where it would be kind of a, a you know, the next step to take it to PCOS. It's like, oh, well, if, if this helps with insulin resistance and these women have insulin resistance, let's use it. Um, I am very, um, actually, I was going to say I was hesitant, but I really don't. I don't recommend at all um, intermittent fasting in women who are reproductive age. So if you are still getting menstrual cycles, I don't recommend it. And part of the reason is that stress piece that we were talking about before where, you know, women's bodies and women's hormones, um, sex hormones in particular are very sensitive to shifts in the diet or any sort of hint that there's a famine coming. You know, if, if there's... You know, your bo it's all about what your body believes. So if your body thinks it's not going to get enough food because you're not giving it breakfast, um, then it's going to hold on to what you have. Um, and it, it does. I mean, there's some mouse studies that um, the ovaries actually shrank in female mice who were following an intermittent fasting regimen. So, so I never recommend it when it comes to women of a reproductive age. Um, I do think possibly later, you know, in, in those menopause years with PCOS, it may be a way to combat those higher risk factors like for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Um, but I don't, I never want to risk affecting the hormones when someone is in that reproductive period, um, mm -hmm. for sure. Definitely. Um, I also I also think, um, this is just my two cents, um, I think people who are doing intermittent fasting are doing it wrong. Um, I think that we should be, I, I just think, you know, I get so many clients who come to me not eating breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, okay, if it were going to work, it would have worked. Um, and clearly it didn't. Um, I think we, we actually are more meant to eat um, in alignment with circadian rhythms with the sun and that when we wake up we need to eat because that starts all of the metabolic processes of the body and I think we need to kind of wind down when it gets dark so we have that that period at night but I don't I don't consider like 12 hours like that you ate dinner at seven and breakfast at seven I don't consider 12 hours a fast per se I think that's just you know sort of a, a normal time frame Mm, definitely, I, think, I agree with that. It's, I definitely think that fasting, probably like an 18-hour 
even probably a little, a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's adding it's adding stress to your body to not eat. So, um, if you have a strong adrenal component to your PCOS, then you know it's it's probably doing more harm than good. So, um, yeah, I, I generally, I mean, most of the women I work with fall into that reproductive age category. So, you know, I'm generally not recommending it. Exactly. Awesome. What so let's kind of move on to some other kind of key things uh, that we touched on blood sugar balance and how that's important for generally all women with PCOS. I feel like it's not it's not just important for women who suffer from insulin resistance. It's something that's just <laughs> for any kind of hormonal problem, just for anyone in general, like all of us. Anyone. It's not a bad diet for anyone because so many of us are on that blood sugar roller coaster. Um, you know, and I'm talking women without PCOS too, who are, you know, hungry, they're grabbing a piece of fruit, their blood sugar spiking, their insulin spiking, they're crashing, then they're binging before dinner, you know, that, that sort of thing. We're, we're all kind of on that blood sugar roller coaster until we actively get off it. Exactly. So before we kind of move on to some other kind of key components is, so with blood sugar balance, it's, it's really about combining the free macronutrients and obviously your micros. Um, you know, obviously the other big thing is, you know, I always get asked, well, how much protein should I be eating? What's the percentage? But I don't know, what, what's your kind of um, response to this? Is Should we be focused on the percentages? Yeah, so there, there are people who definitely like those benchmarks as a way to kind of familiarize yourself. And I think in the beginning, it's maybe not a bad idea while you're learning. Um, so I, I do, I give a number, I generally tell women to aim for, for 25 to 30 grams per meal, um, and about eight to 10 for a snack. Um, you know, and that ends up, you know, adding up to a good amount for for the day most most women do just fine at, at dinner most do fine at lunch breakfast is really where most people fall short um, but other ways we use kind of the plate method you know you want you want one quarter of your plate to be a concentrated source of protein to make sure that you're getting enough um, and it is amazing like when you know someone will tell me oh I have eggs for breakfast so I'm eating protein it's like well each egg has six so are you eating four and they're you know never eating four um so so then we get them adding more protein you know from another source and it's just you know all of a sudden they're full until lunch their energy is steady until lunch they're not having cravings um you know really pushing the protein in the beginning of the day just helps set the tone for the rest of the day i don't know i mean i know i've experienced like if we go out to breakfast and I eat pancakes for breakfast, you know, then it's like, I'm just going to want a sandwich for lunch. And then I'm going to want pasta for dinner. Like it just sets that whole, and I don't have PCOS. You have, you know, the additional complications of the insulin resistance on top of it. Um, but yeah, starting, starting your day on a high protein note just makes you more steady for the rest of the day. Exactly. And so, yeah, I, I can definitely relate. Sometimes when, you know, you just have something when I don't have my protein with my breakfast I just I feel so fatigued as well it's like I just cannot focus it's brain fog and I'm just like well that was a I should spend more time trying to make a breakfast that's you know balanced and I always like regret when I don't take the time to actually make a proper breakfast I was like I'm not doing that again it's like you feel like the day goes like until you get to lunch you're just like oh I feel so groggish and it's just like oh um, but so in your book, you've obviously got some recipe ideas for adding more protein to your breakfast and all these kind of things. But just to get give our listeners a bit of a, I don't know, sneak peek or a bit of an idea, what would be something to up their protein for their breakfast? Yeah, so actually the way the book is laid out is really cool. It's six, 16 weeks of recipes and each week has like a theme. So there is a protein, a fat a fiber and a PCOS power food for each week. So playing on that, um, there's two breakfasts, two lunch and two dinner for every every um, week. So let me see what I've got a lot of in there. Um, 
I know I, I was just doing it. I was just putting a little preview up on my website yesterday. Um, a lot of like protein muffins. So I'm a big fan, especially for breakfast, of things that you can prep ahead and then just grab. So, you know, I'm always running around like a chicken with my head cut off in the morning trying to get out the door. So, you know, if it's set, I'll just grab it and I know I have it. Um, so things like protein muffins, like the one I was putting on my site yesterday was um, black bean chocolate walnut muffins. Um, you know, they're high in protein, they're high in fiber, so they're going to keep you full. Um, I've got a lot of like egg muffins and little mini souffles and quiches. I have um, a bunch of protein oat recipes. So um you know, adding protein into oats to make it a more balanced breakfast. Um, you know, lots of veggie egg scrambles, those kind of things. And then I have a whole um, separate chapter on smoothies. So, you know, you could substitute in a smoothie, you know, which is pretty much my go-to breakfast during the summer because, you know, no cooking and it's balanced and it's fat. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. So I want to ask, because you said one of the recipes had black bean, black beans in them. <laughs> I know people are going to be like, <laughs> like on, on the fence, like, oh, is, is that going to taste like black beans? <laughs> yeah, not at all. It's kind of funny. There's, there's definitely, you know, more, it's more popular now to have things like chickpeas in, you know, um, hummus or dessert hummus kind of recipes. Um, you know, hiding, hiding beans in there, but the black beans blend really well into say anything that's chocolate. So, um, you know, brownies or cakes or anything you can, you can hide, you know, that in there. Awesome. I'm sure everyone's going to be super excited to try some of these recipes. Um, so let's touch on a few more things regarding nutrition for hormones. And obviously one of the, one of the big things is, or two big things is the whole thyroid, which plays a key role in just general hormonal balance and overall health and the gut. So what are some things women should be focusing on? Because I think these are just two things everyone should be focusing on again in general. So what are some of these diet and nutritional kind of things to pay attention to? Yeah, I think, you know, another, another myth when it comes to diets and certain conditions, um, and I hear this all the time that women with low thyroid think they can't eat cruciferous vegetables um, or soy because it affects the thyroid. And, you know, as far as the research goes, you would have to eat so, so much to make an impact on your thyroid. I mean, it's, it's a kilogram, so it's 2.2 pounds of kale or broccoli that you would have to eat before your thyroid hormone starts being affected. Like, I wish I could get people to eat two pounds of vegetables a day, you know? Um, so you're not going to do it. Don't worry about it. Um, um, in terms of thyroid things that, that matter are making sure that you are getting enough nutrients. Um, I don't know, the thyroid, the conversion of the thyroid hormone to active thyroid hormone is dependent on nutrients like selenium and iodine and iron and zinc, um, vitamin, you know, A and E and C, like you need all of these things to make the conversion. So just, there's no, nothing specific I recommend in terms of thyroid. Um, the, the one exception um, for that is when, when it is an autoimmune thyroid condition, um, there is a little bit of research that a gluten-free diet actually impacts um, thyroid antibody levels. So it's always worth trying if it's not going to cause too much stress to your life. I mean, if it's, if it's just going to stress you out, it's not worth it. But if, if you are willing to try it, that's something um, worth looking at. Um, but that's really the only, only thing I would, I would say is, well, let's try it. Um, so that's thyroid gut. Um, I know so many people are like, should I take a probiotic? Should I do this? Should I do that? And, um, I will say, I don't think most people need to be taking a probiotic when I do recommend a probiotic. I'm recommending a very specific strain for a very specific condition, um, and short term only, like we just kind of short term reset it. Um, 
you know, the things that make the biggest impact on gut health are eating a variety of foods. Like the more foods that you eat over the course of the week, the healthier your gut microbiome is. Um, and then um, incorporating some fermented foods in your diet. So yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi, tempeh, um, kefir, those kind of things will, will help support a healthy gut. Um, your gut likes you know, fiber and it likes colors, lots of colors, all those uh, phytonutrients. Hmm, interesting. And let's quickly, so our listeners know if, if they want to find out if they actually are suffering from some kind of thyroid condition or, you know, maybe they're not producing enough of thyroid hormones, what tests do they need to go ahead and get tested? Yeah, so most, um, most doctors in the U.S., um, at any rate, we'll, we'll only run a TSH. Um, a TSH doesn't actually tell us anything about what your thyroid's doing. Um, a TSH is your brain telling your thyroid what to do. Um, so if your thyroid's not making enough thyroid hormone, your TSH will go up. But it's very, you know, it's very possible to have abnormalities and a normal TSH. Um, so TSH, then um, T4 is the hormone that your thyroid actually makes. Um, T3 is the active version of that. So that's where you need all those nutrients to convert the T4 to T3. Um, and then I do always look um, with PCOS at thyroid antibodies, um, the anti-TPO and the um, TGAB antibodies, because um, there is a higher incidence of thyroid um, disorders in women with PCOS and a higher level of subclinical thyroid um, disorders in women with PCOS as well. Okay, interesting. Glad we touched on that because I think, like you said, a thyroid condition, it's like, I think research was like around 25% of women with PCOS suffer from a thyroid condition, so, you know, pretty big. Um, but yeah, taking care of thyroid is really important. And like you touched on some of those vitamins and minerals that are required for optimal thyroid, <laughs> just like this game to everyone, don't go ahead and buy all these supplements and just start taking Because <laughs> that's such like a, every time you say like this supplement, no. you know, everyone's just like, all right, put it on my list. <laughs> just go ahead and buy that one. <laughs> no, especially, um, you know, the thyroid nutrients, so many of them, are relatively easy to get from food. The, the really the most difficult one is the iodine. If you don't live near a seacoast, if you're not consuming fish on a regular basis, um, you know, you may be a little inadequate in iodine, which is why they added iodine to salt, you know, back in the day. But now everyone's afraid of like iodized supermarket salt so they're buying the sea salt that doesn't have iodine but you know if you're not eating those other things that does put you at risk for for an iodine deficiency mm. okay interesting so let's touch on some of these power foods or you know good foods that everyone should be kind of like including into their to their piece of diet to just support hormonal balance yeah, so I would say probably my top one for PCOS is flaxseed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think pretty, flaxseed is beneficial for pretty much every woman because it just does so many things. It can help you um, lower a high estrogen. It can help you feel better um, if your estrogen is low because it binds to those same receptors and activates them. So it may help if you're, you know, having menopausal symptoms. Um, it can help with um, lowering and detoxing androgens as well. So I just, I love flax for, you know, all women, but especially for PCOS. And there is some some research there um, as well. And then it's just, you know, other foods, like I mentioned cinnamon, there's some, um, good studies on cinnamon lowering blood sugar um so i again this is not something i'm saying run out and buy a cinnamon supplement like no it's just it's a really small amount that makes a difference so you know sprinkle some cinnamon on your oats or on your apple or you know just work it in throughout the day um things like um 
like salmon that have the anti-inflammatory omega-3s are, are very beneficial. Um, you know, herbs and spices, um, like spearmint is definitely one. I, I was talking about that on Instagram the other day. Um, you know, spearmint is super beneficial for women with PCOS and it just, you know, goes so well into a salad or a smoothie, um, you know, but it may help lower testosterone and um, improve um, hirsutism. So that's a complaint that a lot of women with PCOS have. Um, so, you know, I'm a big fan of, of, you know, not necessarily eating all of these things every day. Like you shouldn't have a checklist where you're just, you know, trying to eat them all. But, but you know, focusing on incorporating things like ginger that are, you know, really potent anti-inflammatories, um, you know, just working them all in so that, you know, when you are cooking, um, you know, you're never eating something that's just plain. You're adding ginger and turmeric and garlic and, you know, all these things that you didn't know were actually beneficial for your PCOS, but actually taste good too. <laughs> exactly. Cooking with, cooking with spices and herbs just they have these huge benefits, but they just make your food taste so much better. So it's like a win-win situation. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, you touched on black seeds. Now, there's a lot of talk about this on social media with the whole seed cycling, which I kind of briefly want to touch on. And there's like this debate of like, does it help? This is a waste of time. Don't do it. And I'll be like, yeah, it's helped me. So is there any research behind seed cycling? No, I actually, I actually tried to like dig to find the source of the seed cycling regimen as it's presented um, in social media and everywhere. I think they teach it in naturopath, you know, naturopath school, because um, that's, you know, who's promoting it and then people sort of pick it up. Um, as far as research goes, there's a, a decent amount of research on flax. Um, consumed throughout the month. So, you know, the research is on about 30 grams, which is about a quarter of a cup of flax a day. Um, in terms of the, the seed cycling regimen, the two tablespoon or one tablespoon of flax, one pumpkin, and then one sesame, one sunflower, there, there actually is no research on that regimen. Um, there is a little bit of research, I believe, I can't remember if it's on sesame or sunflower. I think it's on sesame um, that if you take sesame seeds during the, during the whole month, it can lengthen the luteal phase. Um, so yeah, I generally just recommend, um, you know, flax every day and consume seeds regularly as part of a healthy diet and you know when I'm when I'm cooking if I'm making a salad I'll throw some seeds on top or if I'm making pancakes or something I'll stir some seeds in just to because they are a very nutrient dense healthy food for you um I just there's there's nothing magical about the seed cycling regimen as it's presented and I think it's overly complicated you know as well I think it's a lot and it, it can be very judgy too. I've seen it like, oh, you must grind the seeds from fresh every day. And it's like, that's not happening. Like I'm buying a bag of ground flax seed and it's living in my fridge and I'm just going to scoop out of that when, when I'm making something, you know. I love how it's just like, really like, just keep it simple and just like, kind of take away all that BS. It's just like, it's so refreshing. Like, everybody's so bombarded with like this strict programming and everyone's like acting like they're so perfect and it's just like I feel like no one's actually perfect everyone's just you know I feel like people are just putting this like whole persona for social media as well and everyone just feels so bad when they're not eating super clean and they're not you know doing xyz it's just like it's just that can really impact yeah, your stress level but it's not helping to be serious anyway it's just like ah. No, I, I hear it a lot. I hear some women who feel like they're a failure because they're not able to follow these complicated regimens. And I mean, I don't know, maybe it's because of my background where I, you know, come from ad advertising. I was working 90 hours a week. Maybe now as a, you know, business owner and entrepreneur, like time is my biggest commodity. Um, my number one goal in feeding myself is to 
feed myself a balanced meal as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I, I think it's nice if you have time for extras that you shouldn't be, you know, thinking you're a failure because you don't have time um, for extras. <laughs> Mm, exactly and I, I like how both you and like Martha McKittrick always talk about you know being super quick and making it super simple um, with, you know prepping meals and it's just like you know supporting people who like number one don't have the time but and number two don't really might not be like the best cook in the kitchen and you know you don't you just want to eat healthy and balance meals without that whole stress of the expectation of what you should be eating and just, yeah, just keeping it simple and sustainable. Yeah, I, I always say Martha is my, my sister from another mister because she's, you know, still in New York. And um, she is also, you know, putting out great content for PCOS, you know, all the time. Um, it's funny, my, my husband actually, um, he took cooking classes in college. So he does know how to cook. He has his you know, few things that he cooks on the nights when he makes dinner, but I did have to train him. So the one rule um, when he makes dinner is there always has to be something green on the plate. Like, I don't care what it is, just put something green on the plate. So he might, like, he actually made nachos last week and he put kale on top of the nachos, which was weirdly delicious, but it worked. I got my greens, he made nachos, it was fine. Oh, we, we. <laughs> <laughs> um awesome so is there anything you kind of want to anything else you want to touch on or it'd be like a tip or big piece of like a final piece of advice or just something to kind of wrap up our episode yeah i think you know one one thing i focus on quite a bit in my practice and um in my messages on instagram and you know, I get, I get so, so many questions from people and, you know, the, the bottom line is that I don't, I don't know because it depends. Um, every, every person, um, is different. Every person with PCOS is different. There are different types of PCOS and different root causes. You know, there was that study that came out last week that was showing, you know, potential, you know, genetic differences between a metabolic type and a reproductive type. Um, and, you know, like you said, we need more research and we need more money to really see what the differences are, because I think, you know, ultimately, it will be more a per, of a personalized treatment strategy um, for for different types. Um, but until then, we don't have that. So the only thing we can do is treat people like individuals. Um, and I will say it's it's completely different. You know, some some of my clients do better with adding more carbs at lunch. They feel more energized. They feel you know really satisfied throughout the day. Other ones do better going lower carb for lunch, but more carbs, you know, for dinner. So, you know, you never really know how a person is going to respond. So, you know, unfortunately, there that means there's no magic bullet and there's no easy answer because it's not one size fits all when it comes to one diet for PCOS or one supplement regimen um, because or one, you know, medication strategy if you're going down that route because, um, everybody's different. So, you know, say that that's why it's, it's important. Um, you know, especially when you're, you're looking at, um, a diet recommendations or nutrition recommendations that are coming from someone who has PCOS and says, this worked for me. Um, you know, that that's problematic because just because it worked for her and she lost weight or got pregnant or whatever the outcome was does not mean it's going to work for you. Um, and it's, it's a really long and expensive road to keep trying those things one after another. Um, you know, it actually is the faster road to figure out what your personal root causes are and so that you know how to address them. Yeah, exactly. Great, great final thing to wrap up. And like you said, we're all different. So it's really, I think people need to go back to kind of being in tune with their body, listening to you know, when you're experimenting with certain things, it's just trial and error and it's just not getting so fixated on what someone else is doing and trying to replicate their diet, their lifestyle for 
hoping it will work for you and not being like a failure if it doesn't work because like you said we're different we don't have the same root cause so yeah i like that piece of last piece of advice and i'll link all these studies uh that we kind of touched on throughout this episode and show us anyone wants to just you know <laughs> uh, go back and have a look at and so how can our listeners connect with you where can they find you yeah, actually, as of today, I believe, um, my website is uh, thehormonedietitian.com. So I finally shifted my website to match my social media. Um, on Instagram, they can find me at the.hormone.dietitian. Um, and the book, A Balanced Approach to PCOS, is available for pre-order on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and a couple of other places and it is available outside the U.S., and it will be available digitally, but not until it launches on August 25th. So that's about all I know so far. <laughs> also, I'm so excited for everyone to, you know, buy the book and read it. It's been such a positive response already. Um, highly recommend you go ahead and check out the website, follow Melissa. Her content is just, you know, like, like we, basically what we've been talking about today uh, is just bust a lot of those myths keeps it simple, very informative, a wealth of knowledge. So thank you once again for taking the time of the day to come on the podcast. Really appreciate you taking time and speaking about your book, what you do, how you can help women with PCOS and yeah, just sharing your knowledge. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me.